and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I am your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the podcast where we talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm talking with Jeff Sanders of the 5 a.m. Miracle Podcast. But first, I want to let you know that this episode is supported by MailChimp. Email is still one of the best ways to communicate. More than 6 million people are using MailChimp to design and send email with the right information to the right people. MailChimp has new automation features which make it easy to provide timely, relevant information to your customers and your prospects. In fact, I'm using MailChimp. Some of the new features include segmentation, personalization, automation, and more. You can check those out at beyondthetodolist.com slash MailChimp. Again, some of those features are that you can instantly send welcome emails to new customers. You can personalize those emails based on those customers' interests. And you can send emails based on the customer's website activity and behavioral targeting. And you can provide product recommendations based on previous purchases. Again, you can check this out at beyondthetodolist.com slash MailChimp. You can also find that link in the show notes, or if you're listening on your phone, crack open that web browser. Come on, you can do it, unless you're driving. And go to beyondthetodolist.com slash MailChimp. Thanks again to MailChimp for supporting this episode of Beyond the To-Do List. Well, this week, it is my privilege, my highly energetic privilege, to welcome Jeff Sanders to the show. Welcome, Jeff. Well, thanks, Eric. I'm glad to be here. Now, you are the host of the podcast, The 5 a.m. Miracle. So first off, I have to ask, is the miracle that people get up that early? <laughs> um, I think the miracle, at least the way that I've described it in the past, is that you have a, a plan for your day and that plan actually happens. I think that's kind of the miracle because most of us have ideas of what we want to do and you know, if, if 5 a.m. is what you want to do because you know you have things you want to work on and then you get up and you actually do those things, I think that that in and of itself could be a miracle. Most people would qualify that as a, a non-religious miracle of some yeah, exactly. sort. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I had a plan for this morning or this day and it happened. How often does that ever happen? That's a exactly. miracle. It's a yeah. Christmas miracle. <laughs> so 5 a.m. Miracle, the podcast, you are – what? You're, you're like 50-something episodes now, right? Yeah, 55. Man, good job. And you haven't missed a week, have you? Not one, not yet. Man, see, so there's there's what consistency and discipline and morning routines and energy and everything we're going to talk about can do for you is get you <laughs> consistent podcasting, which is one of the things that I've not always had, but uh, I always bounce back and then come back with, with greater guests like you. So <laughs> yeah, morning routines. My trip to Nashville from a couple weeks, not a couple weeks, a couple months ago, you spoke at PodCamp Nashville like I did. And if I'm not mistaken, your session was probably one of the most talked about. <laughs> I and, <hope> so. <laughs> it Well, it was. And, and it's even online. And, I, and in fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'll include the, uh, the link to it in the show notes for this called The Best Daily Habits for Content Creators, How to Jack Up Your Energy and Be Crazy Productive, exclamation point. And I knew from your show that you had crazy energy and even some crazy ideas that maybe aren't so crazy. But then I saw you speaking. I was in the back of the room with a smile on my face, just like, man, so many people just need to hear what you're saying right now, you know? Yeah, I think that a lot of things I talk about for, for, for me are pretty obvious because I, I live this way all the time. I mean, even the idea of drinking a liter of water first thing in the morning or eating a lot of bananas like I love to do. Right. These kind of, to me, these are all basic ideas that allow me to have more energy, which creates more productivity later in the day. I think, but for a lot of people, we get into these kind of systems and routines and we grew up in a certain way and we, we don't really question those ideals and we just kind of go with the flow. And a lot of what I talk about, a lot of what I try to live is this idea that if you consciously think about how to actually improve your day and live at a, at a higher level, there are very simple things you can do that produce those results, but they seem a little extreme at first. And I know that when I talk, I mention things that kind of seem over the edge, but yeah. those things work so well that I can't not be excited to talk about those things. Yeah, and it, and it shows. 
you know that I, I ask this question to to most guests, which is in an ideal world, how do you start your day? But honestly, I'm not going to ask you that question because that's pretty much what we're going to talk about this entire episode. I know that you know, like me, that your morning routine plays such a crucial role in how much you get done, how well you do it, and how well you perform for the day that it's just – it's one of those things where it's – I forget who said it. I think it's uh, it, it's either a quote from him or a, a quote he uses all the time. But Dan Miller calls the morning the the rudder of the day, like the rudder on a boat where it aims the, the boat the right way and everything. So, yeah, he has a book about that same title as well. That's what it is. See, I'm I'm I, I haven't had my bananas yet today. So <laughs> my brain is I have had my water, though. So so let's start with that. Another person that we both admire and and know of uh, Michael Hyatt, you modeled your or at least started with in terms of template wise creating your morning rituals or ritual i guess that's what's the difference between a ritual and routine let's start there sure ritual the way that i kind of i looked this up on google because i didn't know at first what this was but essentially a ritual started as a religious idea in the sense that you'd have a set pattern of things you would do and you did them in the exact same order every time so a lot of people for like a church service, for example, a lot of times is a ritual because the, the, the order of events never changes versus routines are things you kind of like accidentally fall into doing over and over again. And so when I discuss like a morning ritual, it's this idea that you have ahead of time decided, here's what I'm going to do in this order. And you repeat that exact pattern day after day. So what do you refer to a series of things you do the same way every day, just do you do you, I guess the, the the thing I'm trying to get at is the plurality of it. Is it ritual or rituals? I would identify like the morning ritual as like okay. this ritual in, in the morning. Maybe you have like another ritual later in the day. So in a given day, you could have multiple rituals. Right. I'd say that. Okay. So your rituals would be like, okay, this is my evening ritual. This is my morning ritual. Yes. And those are your rituals. And I just spent a ton of time talking about wordy <laughs> stuff. But <That's> fine. <laughs> hopefully the productivity nerds appreciate that I'm distinguishing, you know, the, the way that you're describing this because it's it's important, I think. Because a lot of people we have routines, but we don't necessarily have rituals. And I think that that's important. So anyway, you kind of engineered your ideal morning and got your idea from it or your template for it from Michael Hyatt's daily morning routine, which he had a great episode about many, many months ago on his podcast. Explain a little bit about how you took what he did and then how you kind of morphed it or transformed it into what you do now. Well, I've been following Michael Hyatt for years, and he's one of those guys that's just like, he's on the top of the mountain, and I'm just trying to chase him the whole time. <laughs> and, and so what I've watched, like, the content he created, he put out these, this like, uh, basically a template, a set of like, here's how he runs his day. He also has an ideal week template where he, he schedules exactly how his every day will look from the big picture sense. And so I took those templates, and I just I laid them out, copied those you know Excel spreadsheets, and just kind of created my own version. And I customized them and tweaked them and changed them around enough so to this point, it doesn't look anything like what he gave me originally. But now it's become the template that I use for my day. And I don't follow those templates like perfectly every single day. I'm not totally like structured in that sense. But I have that framework, and I use that to guide my at least the major decisions and how things are going to flow. I'm, I'm flexible with it, but I know that whenever I get back to that template and really stick to that structure, my day always works and, and, and so much better for me. I get the results I was looking for in the beginning. And I think even one of the things that people don't really realize, and in fact, we kind of hinted at this with the whole talking about an evening ritual, is I think you, like me, have, have talked about how a lot of the times we sabotage our morning than the rest of the day by the choices that we make the night before. Yeah, one of the major points I always bring up with, uh, with new listeners on the podcast or the, on the 5 a.m. Miracle is that this whole process begins the night before. The evening is where you can think about the next day. It's where you can decide to go to bed on time, which is kind of a really big key there. Because when you go to bed on time, 5 a.m. is not actually that early. It's just another time of the day to wake up. And so if you plan ahead of time, you have that schedule, you go to bed when you said you're, you're going to go to bed. The next morning you wake up and you're ready and you've got a plan and you're actually awake, not just like forcing yourself to drink coffee to be awake, but you're actually up and excited about your day Then you can work through that routine. And then your morning becomes that foundation for the rest of your day. Are there any key things that 
you would suggest to somebody who maybe isn't making wise decisions in the evening? Say they want to start creating a, a good morning ritual and hence they need to create a good evening ritual first. How would they begin going about doing that? The first thing that I always recommend is to have a set boundary of when your work day officially ends. I know a lot of people, myself, myself included, I love to continue to work on projects until the very last second before I go to bed, which is the worst way to do it. You have to act like I set an 8 p.m. boundary, like at at eight o'clock in the evening, computer gets turned off, phone is turned off. I'm not touching work. I'm going to read. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to go to bed like that's a very simplistic, calming activity. So if you have anything that works well, it works for me is to have that set evening boundary of when the day is officially over, your evening ritual begins, which is a very calming and slow process to get your, get your mind and your body ready for sleep. And if you do that probably at least an hour and a half to two hours before you actually plan to be asleep, that gives your body enough time to work into that, that sleep mode so you can fall asleep when you want to and wake up refreshed. So you're talking no screens, no TV, no... Yes. No, net, no Netflix, no anything, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no email. This, like I said, this is a, a boundary that is – it's a guideline. It's not a hard and fast rule. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't always follow it, but it is one of those things that, once again, like when I follow it, it works. And so if there's no iPads, no laptops, no TVs, you know, a, a book is actually really, – like a physical book, not even a Kindle, like an actual book right. is it works well for me as well because I don't have that screen in my face. So I think that that's, that, that's worked well for me. So I think anytime you can reduce the screens, reduce the light – uh, that helps a lot. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been studies. It's the whole thing is it, it just rewires your brain or, or it, at least it stimulates your brain. And by doing that that late at night, you're effectively robbing yourself of sleep because even if you sleep 10 p.m. to like 6 a.m. and get a good eight hours, if you had a screen in your face the last 20 minutes to a half hour or even an hour before laying down, you're going to take a lot longer to first go unconscious Two, hit any deep level of sleep. And three, you're just not going to get quality sleep and you'll wake up feeling like you had like five hours maybe. It's amazing to me that when I get quality sleep, how much better I feel. And it's one of those like reinforcing principles. Like as soon as I get a one good night's rest, I want to do that again and again. Mm-hmm. And so I know – and that actually you know reinforces the idea that I should actually follow what I thought I should do, which is to not have those screens and to actually go to bed on time which I know for a lot of people who are ambitious and productivity junkies, we want to keep doing all the time. And the idea of not doing is the hardest thing ever. And so I know that that for me was the biggest struggle in the beginning. It still is hard every day. But I think that's that idea right there, just to let go of the tasks and just calm down and go to sleep is actually the best thing for you. Yeah, definitely. What about nutrition? I know that you're you're very heavily into feeding our bodies the best we possibly can. Is there anything we can do in the evening that nutrition wise that helps with that the dinners are usually salads for me so i like okay. to do things that are vegetables are good in the evening they're not as like, like i do a lot of fruits and smoothies in the morning which are high in sugar and energy and that sort of thing so in the evening it's going to be a lot more things that don't provide energy boost but still give me nutrition and fill my stomach so that i can go to bed easily uh, and so it's a lot of salads a lot of greens a lot of vegetables and that's the and, and not as much water you know I, I try not to drink a ton of liquid before going to bed because that just makes you wake up in the middle of the night so that's yeah. not as helpful so yeah the evening as far as food is concerned it's usually just eat a nice big dinner a few hours before you go to bed uh, and vegetables are always a good choice so then first thing in the morning because you demonstrated this by holding up your water bottle water before coffee why and how much and you're still letting yourself have coffee aren't you Yes, I do love coffee. I've tried to go off of it so many times. It's just, it's, it's my drug of choice. So <laughs> in the morning I, I wake up and the first thing I do is a liter of water. I drink that. And, and then after the, after the water, I have my espresso. The reason behind this is that coffee, though it stimulates you, wakes you up, it also uh, can dehydrate you. And the very first thing you need in the morning after eight hours of not having any liquid is water. Like your body, and it's amazing when you have that hydration, just how quickly you naturally wake up and feel so much better. Because I'll, I'll drink my liter of water while walking my dog. And so that just the, the walking and the drinking of the water, that alone, that physical activity and that just natural hydration, that wakes me up a lot right there. And then I combine that with espresso and then I have a smoothie after that. And so then I'm just like piling on all the energy supplements I possibly can <laughs> to just feel so much better. So yeah, that's kind of the idea behind it. So people that need a little bit of clarification, how much is a liter in ounces? About 32 ounces. Okay. So about like two of those 16 ounce, 16.9, I guess is what they are. Good or bad for you or the environment. Bottles of water that you'd get from a supermarket. 
and, and a liter of water uh, is a lot at first. Like it takes a while to right. adjust to drinking that much. And that's one thing that when I show the liter of water at PodCamp, people <laughs> are amazed that I drink that much at once. Uh, and, and it's not like, you know, in five minutes, it's over the course right. of about an hour. But even just that much liquid in your stomach at once is kind of hard to get used to. But once you do, it's amazing how, well, number one, it'll go through you pretty quick too, but then it will definitely hydrate every part of your body. And it's just, it's amazing. One of the things that I noticed when I was drinking more water at one point, and I do more so now than I ever have, I guess, and it doesn't bother me. It's not like I'm, you know, running to the bathroom every five seconds is the more that you are consistently hydrated, the more your body actually uses the water versus over hydrating or, or it, your body not being used to drinking that much water. So then suddenly it's just going straight through you instead of using the water. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I've read a lot about how, like, I mean, I'm not a, a scientist, by any right. means, not, not, but the way that your body's trying to balance your sodium and potassium levels and water helps to keep that balance in check. And so if you don't drink a lot of water, your body retains a lot of water, which is why some people, when they try and like, you know, starve themselves uh, to lose weight, they actually gain weight. It's kind of that same principle. It's that mm -hmm. your body needs the, the water to flush out all the toxins and to, you know, replenish itself. And so the more you, the more you consume, your body will actually let go of a lot of that water that's, you're, you're, that's been storing for a while too. So if you have been, you know, dehydrated chronically, when you drink a lot of water at first, you're going to let a lot of that out real fast, uh, which is really good because your body needs that kind of that flushing uh, thing to go on. So you know, overall, just your body will find that balance itself. But if you err on the side of having more than you think you need, you're probably going to be better off. Yeah. And the other kind of key piece is don't feel like you have to crack open a bottle of water and just down the whole thing. It's sipping it over gradually over time. Like, like you said, 32 uh, ounces, one liter over about the course of an hour is actually very doable. In fact, I think at some point I heard you talk with Ray Edwards or the other way around where it was like, yep, I got my 16 ounces of water and I just downed the whole thing first thing in the morning. And, and I've been doing that. So yeah, that definitely works too. Yeah, I, I do space mine now. It depends on the day, like how thirsty I am in the morning, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's about 45 minutes. I'd say on average. We all have heard it before. We need to drink more water. You got to drink more water. Well, it's not impossible. And in fact, it, it doesn't make you have to get up and go all the time. It will a bit more at first, but over time, not as much. I mean, still a little bit more, but whatever. Anyway, it's worth it. It's one of those things where, uh, and I don't think I've heard you talk about this, but just the whole idea that half the time when we have a headache, mm. we're dehydrated. Yes, I mean, mm -hmm. stop, stop with the Advil and the, and the, you know, Tylenol and whatever. And you probably need a good eight ounces of water real quick. And you'll probably within 20 minutes feel a lot better than you would have taken the medicine. Yeah, that was one of the first things that I noticed that I stopped having were headaches when I was, you know, when I began this habit a few years ago, uh, I, I virtually never have headaches anymore. And it's because of this idea. I'm, I'm almost hundred percent like it is the nutrition and it is the hydration that leads to that. So it's a great thing. Aside from, you know, starting your day off with water and then some coffee and, and, you know, obviously physical activity from walking your dog, what else are kind of your cornerstones or your hallmark, I have to do this or the, the majority of the time you want to get these things in in the morning in order to kickstart your day? Yeah, the other key piece here that I kind of hinted at earlier were, uh, is morning smoothies. Uh, I bought a Vitamix blender last summer, and it changed my entire life. Like, it's one of those appliances that, you know, once you own it, you can't imagine your life without it. I had a blender before it, and it was fine. It was just a blender. But then I got the Vitamix, which is like a jet engine in your kitchen. <laughs> and I, mean, I, can, I could blend anything. Like, you could put a rock in there, and it would turn into liquid. It's incredible. But so, that's, so that's where I begin my day. After I have the water and the espresso, I make uh, a big, it's a full, I think it's actually 64 ounces, so a half a gallon approximately of smoothies. And I will drink that over the course of the morning. I'll have about half of it for breakfast and the other half kind of like a mid-morning snack. And that generally consists of all fruit. So it's got bananas, oranges, to you know, tomatoes, strawberries, pineapple, uh, just whatever fresh fruit is in season. And, that's, and I buy it at usually at Whole Foods or some other farmer's market. So I try to get organic stuff as well. And I just have a bunch of fruit. And it's, it, it is the key piece to my nutrition in the day. It's like the thing that gives my body all the nutrients and then the energy I have later on. I can't talk highly enough about smoothies. I freaking love this thing. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I recently had uh, Farnoosh Brock on the show and she just... Yes. I just heard that interview. Yeah. yeah. So she's she's got me all hooked on smoothies. I already was to a certain extent and now I'm just like, okay. And in fact, I'm doing a kind of a, a juicing thing at the same time where I'm 
my, my basically my one ritual right now is is an all day thing. It's this is my health ritual, which is uh, I'm juicing for breakfast and lunch. Then I'm going to eat a light dinner, and then uh, I'm getting my ten thousand steps a day with the Fitbit in, and that's just basically what I'm doing right now. So. Nice. Yeah, I did a lot of juicing a few years ago when I first kind of kickstarted my whole health journey. And yeah, I did a lot of juice. I own a great juicer. I love that thing. It's awesome. So smoothies for you, why have you moved towards smoothies instead of juicing? Because you have experience with that. I began my like health change about four and a half, five years ago. And I began with green smoothies. So it was, you know, vegetables and fruits mixed together. And then I discovered juicing and got really excited about that and thought that juicing was like the new greatest thing ever. Uh, and it was for a couple of years for me. I came back to smoothies because I read a number of different books on nutrition talking about the benefits of whole foods, which is kind of like the whole foods market, you know, grocery stores mm-hmm. based on that idea that nature provides food the way it's meant to be eaten. And so if you consume a, a whole apple, you know, with the, the pulp and, every, and, all, and the juices and all the water and all the nutrients inside, you get more value and your body knows how to process that to optimize the nutrition versus extracting the juice and only having part of it. And so the idea behind it is that the more whole produce, the more whole foods that you eat, the more your body will do what it was designed to do, which is to utilize those fruits and those vegetables from nature and give you everything you need without anything else needed. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's one of the things for me is it, and, and even what was funny was your just your emphasis on bananas when I saw you speak. It just made me realize, you know what? I miss having bananas in my life and I can't juice those. So smoothies yeah. are kind of the way to go cuz you're eating what? How many bananas in a day? Some days? Like, like now, 30? Pro- right now probably around 12. Okay. Uh, when I'm training for marathons <laughs> around 30. Yeah. Wow. That's just I I don't know that I could ever taste-wise handle that, but uh, I mean, you're probably blending half those, aren't you? Um, not Actually, I, I tend to just eat bananas. Uh, I don't blend them as often as people might okay. assume. Um, mostly just because I, I love bananas. And I, I mean, before this interview this morning, I had six. So, Jeez. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, everybody's like, six? You had six bananas in the morning? So, how do you handle that? How do you, how do you, well, one, how do you stomach that? But two, how, when did that start? Like what keyed you into, okay, bananas are this huge source of, well, obviously p- potassium and, and other nutrition, but how did you move into that? And then how did you move into just ramping that up? This is my, uh, my, my vegan story. This has kind of started like four years ago. I became a, a vegan and went full on with that diet. And about six months into it, I discovered a couple of vegan ultra marathon runners. These are guys who are running 100 mile races in the mountains. And like they are just the most elite athletes that I could ever imagine. And bananas were a huge source of nutrition and energy for them on their long runs. And I had just started doing marathons at that time, too. So I was looking into how can I get as much nutrients, as many calories in my body as I can in a way that's going to fill me up and give me energy and so that's where the bananas really kicked in. I was like, well, what I'm, while I'm training and while I'm doing this, I'll just eat all that I can. And then after the marathon was over that I first trained for, I was like, wait, I love bananas. I'm not going to stop eating these things because <laughs> they're great. And so that's where it really kicked in for me. And I just have continued that and they have become a staple part of my diet now. That makes sense. The other thing that maybe some people would think I would have a problem with, and uh, I'll just go there. You don't eat bacon, <laughs> In fact, you have a life without bacon ebook. Yeah, and yeah. I, 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 I was hoping you were going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, here's the thing: I, people would think that you know Eric being all in love with bacon, which is over exaggerated. Trust me, that I would have a problem with that. And in fact, I don't. But can you tell me why? I mean, it's obviously for being vegan, um, and you don't need to go into any of the. Even from just a nutritional standpoint, not any kind of a conscious thing. Uh, you know, from a morality standpoint or anything like that, that as to a lot of for a lot of people as to why they go vegan, why be a no meat person? Well, actually, my story of going vegan started with this, the idea of what it could do for my body. So it was all oh, like a very selfish health endeavor. Where I was yeah. trying to figure out, like, how can I lose weight? How can I feel better? And all the research that I did just somehow tended to point back to the idea that having less meat was better. And I mean, at this point in my life, this is what, about five years ago, I was a meataholic. I mean, I was eating cheeseburgers for breakfast. Like, it was wow. such, like, I was really, I, I ate whatever I wanted. I had no restrictions at all. And so the idea of eating no meat or less meat was really radical at that point. I was very curious about it. And I wanted to know more about it. 
as I read more, I realized that there are a lot of studies and there's a lot of science behind the idea that when you have less meat, you are healthier. And if you have no meat, you're potentially even healthier than that. And that's when I saw that science, I saw that research, I realized like it is scientifically possible. And then I looked for other people that are living like this and with no meat and being healthy and found, in fact, yes, there are many of them who are incredibly healthy and athletic and doing amazing things. And so that's when I realized it's possible for me to do that. It's healthier to do that. Let me try it, see how it works out. And if it works, I'll continue it. And it worked better than I ever thought it would. And it's it lasted for years and I have no plans of stopping. So awesome. Well, one last kind of nutrition focused question. It's not necessarily solely nutrition focused before we kind of move into, you know, where most people are, which is, okay, well, how do I get, how, if I've got all this energy and I've got all this, you know, I've done my morning right, then I should be getting a lot done or a lot done well in my work day. Say somebody's not used to doing all these steps to get their energy. What are some of these maybe quick or easy or I'll do air quotes cheats that somebody semi unhealthy could do to get a quick burst of energy in a good way? Well, we just mentioned the idea of hydration. I mean, that's that's the first thing I always lean to is water. Uh, If you want to just feel better right away, that's the first thing to go to. And the second thing I think is is just more fruit in general. Um, Bananas are good. Smoothies are great. Um, anything that you can put in your body, start, start with what you want to add to your diet. I, I think the mentality behind like letting go of meat is kind of scary for a lot of people. It was for me. So the idea of adding things in at first, like begin your meal with a banana or a, a glass of water in, as a morning snack, like really kind of let that be the, the first go to piece. And that will give you the energy. At least you'll begin to see that process growing from there. If you want to you know, ramp it up afterwards, you can, but at least start with the idea of one banana and a glass of water. And see how that makes you feel and then go from there because that alone will give you a boost of energy you didn't have otherwise. That's an excellent point. And it's one of those things. Those are easy. Those are portable. I mean, water and a banana inside the banana peel are some of the most transportable, high impact energy snacks you can have. And in fact, bananas are the most purchased food in the entire world. So crazy. There you go. Although it's not that crazy. That makes sense. So moving into the work day. Let's keep this theme of rituals. What are some of the rituals that you have set up or you prescribe to people in terms of how they can do their must-do tasks or they want to get stuff done but urgent things keep coming up, that kind of thing? What What's your workflow or your workday rituals? Well, I use a system called Nosby, which is my task manager. And so everything in my life goes into Nosby. Like every event in this interview this morning was in Nosby is like my next scheduled task. And I follow that system. And whenever anything is going to pop up, I just compare it to my list that I have set up for the day and ask myself, does this fit with my, my other tasks? So if something urgent pops up, I, I first ask the question, who is this urgent to? Urgent to me, urgent to someone else? Because most of the time, these urgent things are not actually my highest priorities. They're someone else's email and they're freaking out or it's someone else who wants my attention, but it's actually their problem and they're asking for my help. And so I think one of the key things I always go to is, you know, create your day on paper, on purpose first and know how you want your day to go. And then when these things pop up, because they're going to, you will know better how to respond. And and the hard part here is saying no. Like that's always the most difficult thing is to let someone down. But that's the only way to, to guard your time to make sure that you have really blocked out here's what I want to do today. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's where I'm going to do it. Here's when I'm going to do it. And if anything tries to get in my way, I've got to fight like hell to get them to not let me, you know, to keep me from doing all these things that I really, really want to get done. And so it really is, it's a guarding your time. It's knowing what your time is going to be used to do. And when you have that mentality behind it and that intentional structure, the odds of you succeeding are so much greater. And do you feel that by having all these energy systems in place to where you've got mental clarity or physical energy that when say a disruption comes from outside of yourself and wants to claim some of your time and your attention, you're much better able to play defense and say, no, sorry, or deal with it really quickly and then move back to your task at hand. When you know what it is you want to do, it's much easier to process and to filter things that come at you. I mean, if you have a task in the morning you want to get done, like for example, yesterday I was writing a blog post and I knew I wanted to get done by noon and I had phone calls coming in, I had emails coming in. And so I just turned my phone off, turned off my email program. I was like, I, I know that I can ignore these things for a couple of hours and I know that I can filter them out. But as soon as the, the blog post is done, turn those things on, address them, get them over with, and then go on to my next highest priority from there. 
What about uh, – I know a lot of people and I've even talked to Merlin Mann, the guy who created Inbox Zero. But what's your, what's your perspective on that? I'm a huge fan of Inbox Zero. Um, I stick to it every single day. It's one of those cases where as soon as I realized the potential for processing all my stuff every day, uh, I couldn't let go of that. And so actually I, I created a, a system in, in my own, you know, on my blog with my podcast where, you know, I will guarantee that I'll respond to your email within 24 hours, no matter what. Only exception to that was when I was out of the country last month on vacation. But outside of that, like I have stuck to this idea for years now of I will process every email in 24 hours, no matter what. And it really works. Now, I, I batch those. I, I don't do them all throughout the day. I try to keep them in sections as much, much as I can. But when I batch them, it's actually very easy to process those things and fly through them. And getting to zero is always a good feeling. It's one of those where as soon as I hit it, I'm like, yes, that's what I wanted. Perfect. I feel great. And I can go on confidently to my next task. So, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Inbox Zero. Uh, that's one of those things where once you actually prove to yourself that you can do it, you know that you can do it and you can use that as leverage to do it again. Yes, exactly. In fact, that actually reminds me of something that I've heard recently that you were doing in terms of building up push-ups day by day or, or, and or crunches. Is that right? Uh, it's just push-ups. Yeah, I started okay. that about three months ago. Um, so my goal – actually, I heard this from James Clear, who's a really uh, popular blogger, and I had him on my show a few months ago. Um, he, had, he had started this idea a long time ago where he was going to do uh, push-ups every day, and he was going to add one additional push-up each day. So he, I think he started with 50, which is why I started as well. And then so the next day is 51 and then 52, and you just increase that by one push-up each day indefinitely, as long as you want to go. So yesterday I did 120. Today's 121 coming up. Uh, that's where I'm at at this point. And it's amazing to me how simplistic it is because adding one additional push-up is so small, and it seems so silly to only do one because I, I think I can do more. But if I hold myself back on that, I'm, I'm, I know that I'm growing and I'm not going to injure myself in the process, which I've done in the past. And so <laughs> it's a really great way to guarantee you're going to make progress without pushing too hard and without stopping and not doing anything at all. That's awesome. I think that's one of the things that I mean, we've talked a lot of, uh, a lot about a lot of different things here, and we've only scratched the surface. It, this is kind of the, the tip of the iceberg of everything that you have to offer over at your show and your site, which tell people where to go. Yeah, the site is jeffsanders.com, and the podcast is The 5 a.m. Miracle, which you can find in iTunes as well. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the home base for everything, yeah. So uh, everybody should go check that out. One thing I want to end on note-wise here is, again, it's not about changing all this stuff all at once. It's about making those slow strides. It's like – it's look, everybody can do one push-up. You know, even if you weren't going to start at 50, start with one, and then tomorrow – you can do one more than that. That's not a big deal. And then you just consistently continue to grow. And in fact, this whole idea of suddenly everything's going to be 100% perfection is just, it's just such a, a myth, you know? Oh, totally. Actually, I, my mom saw that I was doing those push ups and she was like, well, I can't do any push ups. I'm like, well, you can do a modified push up. And, you know, you can do something. You can do one of something and start with that. And then you can grow from there. And then tomorrow you can try and do two. If you can't even do two tomorrow, just do one tomorrow and then one the next day and then two, three days from now. Uh, then the point there is the growth. And it's that incremental change over time that leads to success. And it gives you the confidence you need to continue. Yeah, those baby steps. Awesome. Jeff, it's been amazing to have you on the show. I'm glad we finally did this. And yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I can't highly recommend enough. Everybody go check out your show and your blog because if you like my show, you'll love your show. Yeah, a lot of my listeners love your show. So I think that's <laughs> a good fit. Awesome. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric. Well, thanks again to Jeff for stopping by and talking to me about energy and water and bananas. And make sure to check out his show. And also make sure to check out this week's supporter for this episode, MailChimp, by going to beyondthetodolist.com slash MailChimp. Let them know I sent you. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next episode.
Beyond the To Do List is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award winning and award nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, delve into science fiction and philosophy, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.